Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies, ways to transform our lives for better or worse, are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used, or just around the corner, from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. My guest is Thomas Seafried. Um, he's a professor at the biology department, um, and he works on uh, therapy and cancer prevention, metabolic therapy, and how it affects cancer. So, uh, Thomas, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. Yeah. So, tell me um, <clears throat> a bit about your background. What got you into this particular area of research? Well, we've been uh, doing research on on metabolic therapies for a variety of different uh, diseases for for decades. Um, mm. You know, we did a lot of work on the field of epilepsy and ketogenic diets, mapping genes and all these kinds of things. We had been doing work on calorie restriction as a therapy for cancer, uh, as well as epilepsy, as well as for some other neurodegenerative diseases such as autism and, um, you know, uh, Tay-Sachs disease and these kinds of things. But, but uh, okay. you know, one thing led to another and it became clear as to how metabolic therapy could be um, the, I think the most effective way to manage cancer, and then we and then we underline. I mean, we define the molecular and physiological mechanisms by which this all works, and then wow. one thing led to another. So, all right, let's let's uh, let's get into the details a little bit. So, metabolic therapy you mentioned can be calorie restriction. What else is classified as a metabolic therapy? Well, metabolic therapy is a broad, you know, as if you would use, if you were to say chemotherapy, you know, you can say, what is that? You know, it's many different kinds of chemicals that are used to stop the proliferation in one way or another of cancer cells. You know, Mm -hmm. metabolic therapy, you know, is designed to do the same thing. In other words, stop the proliferation of cancer cells, but using uh, using the uh, abnormal metabolic profile of the cells, and you can do it you can you can achieve the same end goal that is stopping cancer cell proliferation by simply uh, removing or restricting the fuels that all cancer cells need to grow. Because without energy, nothing can grow. So right. there's two ways to 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 poison the body and uh, poison the cancer cell at the same time, or you can simply starve the tumor cell of the fuels they need to proliferate. Because without the fuel, they can't proliferate. So the end result is stopping dysregulated proliferation. But the strategies to do this are fundamentally different. So what makes cancer cells different from uh, regular somatic cells? And you know, what kind of therapies will affect them negatively and not the regular cells of your body? Well, I mean, uh, all cancer cells, from what we know... Uh, need uh, fermentable fuels, their their respiration, their com- ability to use um, oxidative phosphorylation or breathing, but basically, is compromised in, in many different ways. So th- that's why these tumor cells can live in areas without oxygen or very, very low oxygen when normal cells can't live in these areas, they die. So the tumor cells can thrive in, a, in an environment without oxygen, um, you know, which protects them against radiation and certain chemicals. Um, and they do that because because they ferment. And this is an ancient metabolic pathway uh, that existed on the planet before oxygen came into the atmosphere. So these cells have simply fallen back on a very primitive metabolic system. And uh, they proliferate like crazy because that's what all the cells did before oxygen came on the into the atmosphere. They, they were all heavily, heavily fermenting and heavily proliferating. And um, so our strategy is simply to target the available uh, fermentable fuels and then transition the whole body off to ketones, um, which are respiratory fuel. The tumor cells can't effectively use ketones, but all the normal cells can, most of them. And um, and then from the rest of the body because they, they, they need fermentation fuels and they can't use ketones. So it's, a, it's, it's not a complicated process. I've heard that hyperbaric oxygen, for instance, may be a therapy for people with cancer. Is that because um, it, it supposedly saturates the tissues with oxygen? which the cancer cells uh, either don't need or maybe they don't like? Or is this, yeah, uh, well, it's, is it's a common, yeah, 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 you're right. Um, so so um, when, you, when you treat cancer with radiation, you know, the, main, the mechanism of killing 
is to create reactive oxygen species. So the electron beams hit oxygen molecules and they blow up in the local area, and that kills the tumor cells by what we call oxidative stress, oxidative stress. So if we we can achieve, we think, we can achieve a similar end goal if we use hyperbaric oxygen. So, but what protects what protects the cancer cell from radiation and chemo is a powerful antioxidant system that is driven by the two fuels that they use to ferment, which is glucose and glutamine. So our plan is to reduce the availability of glucose and glutamine and then uh, put them in a hyperbaric chamber. Now, the, of course, the, you remove glucose and glutamine and you elevate ketones, and ketones can be metabolized without producing reactive oxygen species, but the tumor cells can't use the ketones. So they become um, differentially susceptible to oxidative stress using hyperbaric oxygen. So in other words, we, we think we can kill the tumor cells in the same mechanism as radiation with far less collateral damage and toxicity to the normal cells. Interesting. Um, so it sounds like either fasting or um, being on a ketogenic diet would be a good add-on to perhaps chemotherapy or radiation or other treatments for cancer because it would, uh, it would I guess, protect the regular cells of your body and weaken or put the cancer cells into a state where they're more susceptible to the therapy. Yeah, it's possible. You know, a lot of people would, would you know, think that this is the way to go. In other words, we might be able to reduce the, t the dosages of chemo and, and radiation and these kinds of things, um, which certainly could be the case. I don't want to say that we, that we, we can't do that. Um, on the other hand, if the metabolic therapy achieves the same goal as radiation and chemo, why would you want to use radiation and chemo? Right, of course, yeah. yeah. Right? Unless people like it. I mean, some people feel that they have to be exposed to toxic chemicals. But, you know, the, the issue, of course, is that in all the trials that are being done, unfortunately, the, con the critical control group is never included in the analysis. So you have... You have two main groups. You have standard of care, which is the radiation and chemo and immunotherapy or whatever whatever you want to use. And then the other group is the standard of care plus metabolic therapy. Okay? So the critical control group is always missing. That is metabolic therapy alone without toxic uh, radiation or chemo. And they won't do that. That's not part of what anyone will do. Well, the problem is, you know, if you have cancer, you'd be afraid uh, to not do that stuff because what if the, uh, the stuff you do Listen, doesn't work? We, we, you know, we have 1,600 people a day dying in this country from cancer in the United States. Every day, over 1,600 people. This is data published by the American Cancer Society. I mean, there's hmm. a lot of people every day dying. And a lot of these people are treated with all these toxins. Nothing more we can do. Well, if it were treated with metabolic therapy up front, they may never be in this situation in the first place. Uh, those people who are risk takers and pioneers have done metabolic therapy without standard of care, and many of them are doing far better. Now, we're trying to publish these. We've published a couple of cases. Yeah, I'd be afraid. Hmm. You know, I'd be afraid to be irradiated and poisoned, to be honest with you. Um, you, you know, you have, to put, you have to put the patient in, the, you have to put yourself in the, in the shoe and say, well, listen, what's your track record? How well do you do on this? Do, uh, what are the adverse right. effects from being radiation and chemo, immunotherapy? So, and then you say, well, maybe chemo, maybe metabolic can be moved in with those. And I said, yeah, maybe it could. You have to just uh, see what happens. So what are some of the uh, metabolic therapies and protocols that you've seen used and what were the effects? Well, the metabolic therapy, we've published a couple of papers um, on this already. Uh, an Egyptian with glioblastoma. Uh, we had another person, an Italian woman with glioblastoma. And then we've had the, the breast cancer, stage four, triple negative breast cancer. Um, the biggest problem with metabolic therapy right now is compliance. Um, some of the patients just get tired of doing metabolic therapy, and it is hard. It's a, a piece of cake. But uh, well, what's involved? What, what makes it hard? Yeah, well, you have to first step is what we do is we bring the blood sugars down. So, um, and that's tough. So we use a ketone index calculator, which is a, um, uh, you know, your standard blood. It's a, it's a device that you can get from Amazon that measures blood glucose and ketones, and you can use strips. And you have to bring the blood sugar down of the patient and the ketones up. So you get into a, a ratio of blood to ketones of 1.0 or below. And believe me, it's not easy because a lot of these patients are on uh, on toxic drugs, which forces their blood sugar up. So it makes it it makes it can be challenging. Let's put it this way: it can be challenging. However, once the patient is entering into what we call therapeutic ketosis, 
where they where they're in a very uh, new homeostatic state. Then we use drugs and procedures that facilitate further stress on glucose and glutamine. So, um, you know, we have 2-deoxyglucose. We have some other glucose-targeting drugs that can be used in low dosages. And then we have hyperbaric oxygen. And we're working on some glutamine inhibitors now. But you have to target glucose and glutamine simultaneously because if you just target one fuel, the tumor cells can simply survive using the other fuel. And if you target the other fuel, they turn back and use glucose. So you really have to target both glucose and glutamine simultaneously uh, while the patient is in therapeutic ketosis. So there's a number of things that you have to do to prepare this individual. And then what we do is the tumor cells become gradually degraded over time because it's not a one blast and everything is dead. You have to gradually degrade the tumor over time while enhancing or not harming the vitality of all the normal cells. So it's, a, it's an entire metabolic shift in the body. And we think from our preclinical studies, we think this would work remarkably well in humans. In fact, better than it does in our preclinical systems. Um, quick, quick question for you. You said glucose and glutamate. Glutamine. Yeah, glucose. Glutamine. 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 Sorry, glutamine. Glucose and glutamine. Um, I think I understand where people get glucose from, you know, various foods and sugar and all that. But where does, where does glutamine come from? Well, glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in our body by far. Um, it's, it's pretty ubiquitous. It's involved in many, in many uh, biological functions, the urea cycle. It's a fuel for our immune cells. So there's no dietary therapy that can target or eliminate glutamine. Um, so you have, we, we think we need to use drugs uh, to do this. And some of these drugs are under development in, in a number of pharmaceutical companies and, and a variety of other places. Um, right now, most of the drugs that have been tested uh, have not been uh, as as uh, effective as people would have thought. You know, we work with one particular old drug, um, 6 diazo uh, norleucine, uh, which which seems to do a really really good job. Uh, we have also found that um, when there, when when preclinical animals are in ketosis, uh, the toxicity of the drug um, is minimal. Um, so we're dealing with issues that were that were previously considered a problem, and we're eliminating those problems as, as we speak. And I know other groups are trying to make different analogs of these kinds of drugs. So I, I think the future is bright um, because once we have the effective drug to target glutamine, uh, and we already know we can target glucose effectively, and when you do this in a state of therapeutic ketosis, I think we're going to be very successful in managing cancer without toxicity. But what causes um, someone's body to make glutamine or not make it? You know, does the diet yeah, affect it? You know, if I'm on a ketogenic diet, will I make the same amount of glutamine as if I'm on a regular, you know, sugar diet? Yeah, I think so. So you, that's why you need drugs. I, there's no dietary way to reduce glutamine. I mean, you can change it a little bit, but it's not um, because it's made from, it's considered a non-essential amino acid. So, of course, it's made from glucose. So if you're reducing glucose, you're going to have some uh, reduction in glutamine. But but the the, the glutamine can be obtained from muscles. You know, the body can can uh, sequester glutamine from, and this is one of the things about cachexia. When pa cancer patients are shriveling up, uh, their muscles are, are, are being degraded because you can get a tremendous amount of glutamine out of muscle tissue. And some so, of the amino uh, acids how? will go to the liver and they'll make glucose out of these, out of conjugating amino acids. So the body, the cancer cells it's themselves can, can generate glucose uh, and glutamine from the, from the muscles. So that's why, you know, we use... We use the we use the therapeutic ketosis as just one part of the of the of the procedure. It's not the goal. We think everything will work better in a state of keto, uh, therapeutic ketosis, and that gives us many many more options than we presently have. And how were you able to accomplish the therapies that you spoke about with the uh, people that had glioblastoma? Did you yeah, give so them a drug did, to suppress their glutamine? Yeah, we we tr we tried with chloroquine and we tried with EGCG, but you know, in my view, I don't think. These guys work pretty well in culture, but they're, you know it's they're partially effective in vivo. Um, the problem with our, our our GBM patient, you know, we put him on therapeutic ketosis. Uh, we fasted him for three days, put him on therapeutic ketosis for three weeks, and then debulked his tumor. He was very doing very well. Then we put in the hyperbaric oxygen with uh, chloroquine and EGCG. He was doing very well. We put off standard of care, which is toxic radiation and chemo, uh, temozolomide for three months. So we really changed the standard of care. And he was doing really well. We didn't, as a matter of fact, 
um, uh, he was doing remarkably well, and we were very concerned as to why he was forced into a radiation. Because, you know, why are you, why are you putting radiation on somebody who's doing really well? But, you know, it's the standard of care, and you can't get away from it no matter where you are. So um, he did well up to th almost 30 months when he started to have headaches, and, and it turned out that he had a lot of damage in his brain from radiation necrosis, and he passed. So right. you say to yourself, you know, if we didn't irradiate the guy, he might have been still alive. We don't know. So how do, how do people, uh, you work with physicians, how do people come to you and get these treatments? And uh, Well, we have to do it do overseas. Standard of care or? <laughs> yeah, we have to do it overseas with this less, less rigidity. But even overseas, it's difficult. So, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the locked in standard of care, it's supposed to be a, a recommendation guideline, <laughs> but they've made it written in granite. So it becomes extremely difficult to vary the standard of care. So if we do it right, if we do it the way we think we should do it, I think because we have people, Pablo Kelly, he's doing really well. No, no radiation, no chemo. He pushed surgery off for two years. He's still doing very well. He's out four years with a glioblastoma. So I think oh, wow. lot, I think I think people can survive tremendously long if they can avoid radiation and toxic chemo. I mean, if you do meta, if you substitute metabolic therapy for standard of care, I think we're going to get because don't forget we we don't use any of the radiation and chemo in our mouse models in our preclinical models and they do well. So if we did the same thing in humans, I think we'd do a lot better. I mean, why are we doing that in the first place to stop proliferating cancer cells? But if you can stop it using another completely different te uh, technique or pr a procedure, you might not need to do radiation and chemo. So then what are you going to do then? What, what are people going to do then? So where, all right, so if, if someone listening, you know, has cancer and they want to consider metabolic therapy, do they have to go overseas? I mean, how would they even find practitioners yeah, to offer this? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's such a it's such a tragedy. You know, all the so many physicians fear applying metabolic therapy because it's not consistent with standard of care. So the argument is, oh, we can't do this until we have clinical trials. Well, there's a if you go to uh, clinicaltrial.gov, there's a lot of trials underway, but none of these trials are doing metabolic therapy alone. So they're all doing it, as I said, mm. as a com combination with other things. So then you'll go to a physician and say, can you do like like our, we've published the the press pulse with Dom Diagostino and uh, my my surgeon, uh, neurosurgeon colleague um, Joe Maroon and an oncologist uh, George Yu. I mean, we published a paper, press pulse that outlines the strategy by which you would apply metabolic therapy to cancer patients. The problem is when you go to use that in the clinic, they, they say, well, we can't do that. It doesn't fit the standard of care. So you're caught in this catch-22. You know what you need to do, but you can't do it. Cool. So how did the, uh, the the lucky patients that you worked with, again, get the therapy? Did they contact you and then you, uh, the, well, you know, don't forget someone overseas? Or yeah, but I mean, don't forget, they're all doing some level of chemo, even though it might be very low. Um, mm. You know, it's called, uh, you know, restricted care. I mean, people have to follow this the standard of care because they don't think there's anything else possible that will keep these patients alive. And therefore, right. we're, we're, no matter where we go, uh, we're always confronted with this. And as I said, you know, so I think it has to become, and, and the other problem we have is most of the physicians that uh, that would apply this are, have never heard of it. They don't know what to do. They feel embarrassed or, or lost, or they just discount it because they said, if it, were, if it were so good, how come I didn't learn about this in medical school? We don't learn about metabolic therapy in medical school. This is just not part of the, the training. So, yeah. you know, and, you know, we're basing it on the hard science of what, what the biochemical problem is in the tumor cell. So the, sci the basic scientific literature is filled with support for this kind of approach. But when you get into the patient in the clinic, you, you can't do it. Um, so this is the, this is the uh, unfortunate tragedy about the whole thing. So what, uh, all right, what, what cancers have you uh, seen affected positively by metabolic therapy? Are there any ones that are completely resistant or is it only a certain one? No, they're all the same. I mean, you know, every cancer cell has the same problem. It ferments. So it could be a fermenter in your lung cancer. It could be a fermenter in colon, bladder, breast, brain, you know, um, all of them. They all do the same thing. They all need glucose and glutamine to survive. So when you do it right, uh, you get an effect for all the cancers, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, uh, colon cancer, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, brain cancer. As I said, they're all the same. And we know that because there's a hmm. massive scientific literature saying the same thing. They all have a Warburg effect, which means they're fermenting glucose. And we all know they take, they're glutamine addicted. So all cancers are, use a Warburg effect and are glutamine addicted. It clearly says that they need glucose and glutamine. What happens when you take glucose and glutamine? They die. It's not that, it's not that complicated. 
what happens if uh, you just try to get get rid of the glucose? Nope, it still won't stop them at all. I mean, let's say you're you're real strict. You're eating keto. Um, you know, you're you're dialed in on your, your nutrition. You're doing hyperbaric oxygen and all these other therapies, but you don't have access <clears throat> to the drugs that would restrict glutamine. Yes. How much of an effect do you do you estimate it may have? None, some. No, most of the interestingly enough, most of the cancers do have some effect. We've never found a cancer that doesn't have some effect. Some have a huge effect. Some have moderate effect. But we can't. I don't think we can long-term manage cancer with just targeting glucose. And I've been telling people that for a long time because they don't understand that there's another fuel that the cells can use. And if you target that, they're checkmate. There's no other fuel available in the micro environment of the tumor cell that can prevent them, that can substitute glucose and glutamine only because those are the two most abundant fuels. So yeah, if you take away really restrict glucose and you clean up the micro environment, make it less acidic, yeah, the tumors grow slower, but they continue to be there. So they just grow slow. And uh, I mean, which is good. I mean, you're set, you don't have to worry about, you know, this massively aggressive cancer. But on the other hand, they continue to grow. Unless you take away the glutamine, they, they'll, they'll, they'll survive. So it's not like they're wily or, or, or capable. They just, you just, People haven't targeted the two fuels that they need to grow. Once you target those two fuels, these cells can't grow. There's nothing else available. We looked at all this stuff. We did it. We looked yeah. at it in many different ways. Um, have you seen people where the cancer completely goes away? It's literally starved to death and then it's gone, or is there always well some in Pablo? Yeah, others? several people. Yeah, we've ha- we've seen, and I don't know. Got, got, okay, it goes away. You know, by what by what criteria? MRI. Uh, you know, looking at CAT scans, MRI, PET scans, and this kind of thing. You know, you say, well, it's gone. It's gone. Well, this is what happened to the person we had from uh, from Italy. It looked like it was gone. No PET scan evidence, no no MRI evidence, and and then they went off the metabolic therapy, and the and the tumor came back. So you can't really see if you've killed all tumor cells based on these crude uh, imaging analyses. So sure. um, you, you really you really need to, and that's one of the things about the compliance issue right now, because you know how long do you have to stay on this metabolic therapy before you can feel that you, you can get out of the woods. And um, and that's why we're working. We, don't, we haven't used the full battery of drugs and procedures that are available that could expedite this whole thing a lot faster than what we're doing right now. So, um, and that we have a little bit more research to do on this dosage, timing, and scheduling will tell us how long we have to uh, maintain these pressures. But right now, um, you know, unfortunately, the compliance issue, so people are just trying to target glucose and when you do long-term glucose targeting, you know, it becomes a hassle after a while. You can't eat any carbs. You can't do this. You know, you can't do right. that. So uh, you really want to be part of the society. You want to say, well, geez, if I do this for six months, I'll be okay. But, you know, without targeting glutamine, you might not be okay. Hmm. What, have you, what have you seen of the effects of reducing glutamine in the body? Does it adversely affect people? Yeah. So you have to be very careful. People have to know how to do this because our immune system needs glutamine and our gut needs glutamine. So if we're too aggressive on targeting glutamine, we could harm uh, normal systems in our body. So if you kill a whole bunch of tumor cells, you need a, a group of other cells to come in and pick up the dead bodies, the dead corpses of the dead cells. And if you paralyze your immune system, the dead cells lay around, cause an infection, and it could harm the patient. So you have to know how to pulse. This is the whole concept of press pulse. So you press the glu- glucose as best you can, and you pulse the glutamine uh, targeting. And it's, you know, it's it, this is... These kinds of, I mean, the, 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 we can work out the details. It's not like we already know what we need to do, and, and we, we know we can do it very effectively. It's just that we have to work out some of the doses, timing, and scheduling so we don't harm the rest of the body. So, you know, people have to be familiar with systems physiology. They have to know a lot of things about how the normal body works before you can do metabolic therapy. And unfortunately, a lot of the a lot of the uh, oncologists uh, don't know anything about it. Right. If you pulse the drugs that would reduce glutamine, what what have you seen as the effect in people? Are they okay so long as you pulse it? Well, do they tend yeah, to get we sick haven't a lot really, or other stuff? Yeah, we haven't really done it yet because the only thing we've used are some very minor glutamine targeting drugs. We haven't used the big hammer. And uh, oh. so far, you know, like Dawn and these other, other drugs um, that are out there that haven't been apl- applied together with meta- with therapeutic ketosis. So once we start doing that, I think we're going to see some really, uh, really big effects, I think. Um, mm. And I know the pharmaceutical industry is really hot to, to work on glutamine targeting drugs, but their their interest is in, in patenting things. Um, and obviously, they want to make money on this whole thing. So 
they, they're not going to explore previously effective glutamine targeting drugs because you can't make you can't patent them, even though they could be very powerfully effective in patients. Um, so they're waiting to get some sort of a, a patentable drug that can do what, what some of these older drugs can do. So, so therefore, they'll have the rights to it. You know, my job is to see how long is does the concept work? Does it work? If we target glucose and glutamine and keep people alive without without, without adverse effects, then we can you know we can move forward with that. But I just I don't know what the ethics or the legality or any of that stuff is here. But you know, I hope not. But some people listening to this may be dealing with cancer and maybe dealing with like, you know, a serious aggressive one. I don't know if you can recommend what they do or if you can recommend a, a, they look into certain things or I mean, what can you say to people like that, that obviously are crying out for help? Yeah, it's kind of tough. I mean, I get them and I, I give them a packet of information um, that has a lot of papers and contacts, physicians, and books and procedures and things. It's an educational packet. And you know, there's people in there that they could contact because, you know, I can't, I'm not a physician, so I can't treat anybody. Um, right. All I can do is bring them to information and people that might be able to help them, depending on, on where they are. So I, I think there are some physicians that are really very, very disturbed by the whole thing and not being allowed by the system to treat the patients the way they think they should be treated. Um so there's a big educational shift that has to happen. And right now, everybody is, um, everybody, I think the whole field is like um, psyched about immunotherapies. and They think they're going to get the type of response. And some of these people are going to do well on these immunotherapies, but I think a lot of them aren't. Um, and that's oh. because it's based on the gene theory of cancer. And it's been, the gene theory of cancer has been undermined. So you don't really expect to get a lot of a massive reduction in death rate from a therapy that's not based on what the actual disease is. So it's just one of those things. Well, can we go into that briefly? So what? tell listeners, what is the gene therapy of cancer? And then what is the theory that you see that appears to be more correct or correct? Well, right now it's called the somatic mutation theory of cancer, that the gene mutations cause these cells to grow out of control. And um, you look for mutations and you try to target these mutations and the concept of personalized therapy or, um, you know, these kinds of targeted therapies, personalized therapy. And this is all based on the concept that cancer is a genetic disease, that the mutations themselves are what's responsible for the abnormal cell growth. And, you know, we published papers, uh, Sonin, Sheen, and Soto from Tufts, and many other people have published a whole series of papers that completely undermine the gene theory. Cancer is not a genetic disease. It's a mitochondrial metabolic disease, and the mutations have been shown clearly to be downstream uh, uh, effects of the damage to the respiration in the cell. So they're not the drivers or cause, they're an effect. So if you're treating effects, you're not likely to make any major impact on the outcome. And this is clearly seen in the, death, in the deaths of all the cancer patients. And we're not making any... Cancer is increasing now faster than the general population is increasing in both the numbers of new cases as well as the number of dead people each year. So, and this is all based on the immunotherapies are based on the idea that these tumor cells have mutations that will be targetable by a cell-based uh, immunotherapy. And in some cases it works, in many cases it doesn't. And in many cases it harms you significantly. Now you shouldn't be treating any, any person with anything that has the remote possibility of harming them. So, yeah. well, they figure that all cancer therapies are toxic, so this is just one more. And that's all based on the gene theory. And, and if, it's, if it's a metabolic disease, you can target and kill the tumor cells, you know, with, with, without the toxicity. All the cells are fermenting. That's the, that's the mitochondrial metabolic theory. So you go after the common phenotype that all the cells have, rather than the unique genetic differences that each cell has, which is a downstream epiphenomenon. So the whole paradigm has to change. The whole concept of what people view cancer as has to change before we understand um, how how more effective we can build these therapies that don't harm anybody. So you, you've written a book about exactly what you're talking about, right? The the origin. Yes, I the have. Reason that... So if they continue to yeah. fall back on false uh, research that we and others have have shown to be incorrect, and a lot of people just don't read the. And I don't. I, you know, it's really to be to understand what's going on. You got to spend a lot of time reading these papers. And um, for every one paper that says one thing, there's another paper that says something different. So you have to be able to wade through the things that are real versus the things that are flawed. So most people have made a decision about cancer based on cells growing in culture. I mean, most of the research is being done on cultured cells. 
This is not the way they grow in the in the living tissue. I mean, this is a tremendous mm. reach. So we've built a whole bedrock of we we've built a whole uh, uh, view of cancer on a on a bedrock of sand based on cells growing in culture. And um, you know, and, and well, you got to look at the guy's tissue. You got to look at the whole physiology of the person before you can really understand what's going on. The microenvironment and all these different kinds of things. Metabolic therapy targets the microenvironment. It reduces the fuels to the tumor cells, and it also corrects a lot of other metabolic imbalances that many cancer patients have. Okay, there's very few people that are perfectly healthy, and then they get cancer. They have all these other metabolic maladies. Often, often. like what? Oh, like type two diabetes. You know, they have C-react elevated C-reactive protein. Um, mm. You know, they're they're they've been on a on a on a wrong food diet. They're smoking. They're doing this. They're doing that. There there there's a lot of risk factors that are involved in the origin of cancer, damaging the respiration. And once you get that imbalance, you know, you need to correct, need to get rid of the tumor cells and also correct the metabolic imbalances in the body all at the same time. And our procedures now is we're going to give them high dose ra- radiation and chemo which causes a tremendous amount of inflammation and raises blood sugar levels, the very things you don't want to do. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of cancer survivors out there, but many of these people have paid a severe price for this for this management of their disease. They're, they have yeah. all kinds of hormonal imbalances. They have, uh, you know, they have digestive problems, neuropsychiatric problems, all kinds of problems for being treated with highly toxic chemicals. Yeah, they don't have cancer, but they've got all these other things. You know, why do that when you don't have to? I, I, yeah, I totally agree. Most people agree. And then they say, well, why aren't we doing it? And I said, well, it's the system. The system is entrenched with a, a view of cancer that's upside down. And, and the, everybody's so comfortable radiating and, and using all these toxic chemicals. And it's just the procedures that everybody does. And there, by the grace of God, somebody goes and says, you know, I once had cancer. And a lot of these cancers are benign, and they're be, and they're being treated with, uh, you know, it's like, you know, baseball batting a, a fly. You don't really need to do so much mastectomies and all these surgical mutilations. I mean, it's unbelievable. So, but this why is the you, stand, this you, is what's uh, going on today. This is what's happening. Why do you? So, with with current medicine, any any tumor is considered by def, if it's cancerous, any tumor is considered by definition. A hazard that must be stopped immediately and at all costs. Is that is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah. Well, sometimes that's true. I think a surgery can cure a lot of cancers. I mean, and they have. They have. The the problem is is sometimes the surgery is so aggressive that it doesn't need to be. You see what we do. And then the other problem is they take these needle biopsies to tell you what kind of cancer you have, right? So you, right. you, you breast cancer, colon cancer. Oh, we're going to do a biopsy. So the very process of doing a biopsy creates a, a, an inflamed micro environment, which runs the risk of taking a benign a benign cancer and making it metastatic simply by assessing what kind of gene mutations, which are largely irrelevant. So we put all these many, we put many cancer patients at risk for more aggressive disease by the very fact of sampling the tissue. Shrink it down. Why? Why? Because it draws some of the cells out of the site and lets them float around the body or why is it? No, you, it I mean, you take, you're stabbing. If you take a, a needle a biopsy of a normal tissue, just take a muscle, you know, the, the local microenvironment views it as a wound. And then you, blow, you you bring in all these cytokines and growth factors to try to heal the wound. Well, these things right. can be stimulatory towards the growth of the tumor cell that might be in an indolent state. And now by the very process of sampling it, you've made it malignant. And there's plenty of papers in the literature that describe this. It's not like I'm I'm making this up. I mean, this is this is already published in the literature for a variety of organs. So why are we doing that? So you say, well, we can get a gene readout and give you personalized medicine. But if the genes are largely yeah. irrelevant yeah. downstream epiphenomena, then why are you wasting your time doing that in the yeah. first place? See, a lot of people don't think about all this. They just go ahead and do this so, stuff. So, all right. Well, I'd like to give some resources to listeners. So what's the name of your book that they should start with? Or what's, what's the number one resource well, they should start with to learn? Yeah, well, my book goes into the heavy scientific detail. And also, on the per- I mean, you know, there's some chapters that I think everybody can read. And there's other chapters that only professionals in the field could could wade through. Um, cancer is a mm-hmm. metabolic disease on the origin management and prevention of cancer. Um, okay. And and then and then you have Keto for Cancer by Miriam Kalamian, which is actually a how to stop the cancer using metabolic therapy or therapeutic ketosis. And then you have Travis Christofferson's book, uh, which is pretty much a lay version of what I've done um, and brought it out to the, that the emergence of cancer is a metabolic disease. So, and you know, the money that it's hard to get money to do this kind of research. Um, so we're, 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 we're dependent on private foundation money, uh, mostly, um, to do this kind of work. 
um, because you know it's hard to get a grant when you when everybody thinks cancer is a genetic disease and you, and the approach you're taking is not that. So, um, but you know, I think in the long run, I don't know how long that run is going to be. People will come to realize what what we're saying is actually true. And when you start to see a lot more people surviving their disease without toxicity, you'd be surprised how many people will want to know what's going on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. All right. And then um, uh, you mentioned a packet that you would give to people yeah. that, that come to you for help. Do you yeah. want people to come to you for the help, or is there a place they can well, go to get all this information curated? Or You know, I, I don't know if anybody has the information, but in the packet, they have they have contacts people where they can get more information. Um, I give them references to books, videos, people who um, who are doing this, uh, who have videos and telling others, you know, what they've done to to survive and how how it was for them. You know, it's it's one thing. Do you have this online, or does someone have to? Do you have to mail it to people, or how can? No, I mail it to people. I I mail it. The only thing I ask is they make a donation to the Single Cause Single Cure Foundation, the Foundation for uh, Metabolic Therapies. Where a hundred percent of the money okay. goes into into research, there's no administrative costs for that. It's very different from any other foundation, as far as I know. But you know, All it's right, up so to how, the, it's up to people to make you know if they feel they want to make a donation for the information. That's great. It's wonderful. Oh, well, how can how can they do that? For well, it's in the packet. Now, they, 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 they the foundations they are, the are mentioned in the in the packet. So, and I tell you now, it's you know you can look online and you'll see the Foundation for Metabolic Therapy, Travis Christofferson's foundation. He, do, he he donates 100% of the money to basic research uh, in metabolic therapies primarily. So um, he has a he has a website, you know, and we 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 get funding from um, CrossFit. You know, there's 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 people out there that that really think what we're doing is is the is right, and they want to support us. Um, right, right. Because they think we're right, and you know, people sometimes write us a check or set up a grant to the university at Boston College. And say, listen, I want all my money to support the research, and we set up a a grant through the university. So, um, so people are, are excited about doing that. And then, of course, we acknowledge anybody who gives us money. Uh, we acknowledge them in the publications that we have. So, uh, um, so we, they can see directly what's happening with the money they give. It's it's not going to be a mystery like you know going into all this administrative costs and all this other stuff that people do. No, no, no. All that right, money right, goes right. into yeah. the research. Well, I don't I don't want you to be besieged by people emailing you and calling you. So is there a way for them to get this packet that doesn't involve like calling you and you putting something in the mail or is that, no, they have to, it to be? Yeah, I know. I, I, you know, I just do it. Um, because if I put it on, it changes. So I, every time I see something new, I, I include it in the packet. And, um, okay. so it's always, it's always updated. And, uh, right. if you set it out there, you don't know what's going to, what's going to happen. So yeah, people, they email me. I've like, I've got three or four right now. And, I just, um, you know, fire it back and I have a little note that goes with it. And it's several pages and I include several uh, articles, depending on what kind of cancer the individual might have. If they have brain cancer, I send them the the, the, the reference articles on glioblastoma and people who have used them. And if it's breast cancer, right. I send them a different article. And, you know, so it's just you put it together for each individual and, and then they can make with it what they do. And then they usually get a hold of Miriam Kalamian or, or some other physician listed on the uh, and then they work their, their their therapy out with those folks. Okay. Well, very good. Um, what do you see as the uh, the near and you know medium term future for metabolic therapy? What uh, any big things coming? Any changes? Sea changes? Well, I, I think you know we've published the outline of how to do this. The people who do it seem to have really good. I'm publishing papers with my colleagues from different countries. Um, I think eventually, eventually, it's going to be the dominant form of cancer meta- uh, therapy. It's going to make most other therapies obsolete. This is my viewpoint. I'll probably never live to see that, but it's based on such hard science and it's based on the correct, the correct problem in the cells that you can't deny it. It's just a matter of time. You can only you can only say it doesn't exist for so long. But you know you have to you have to change an entire paradigm. You have to change a lot of things, and people don't like to change. So you know how it is. Right, I understand. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't have. Uh metabolic issues in the first place so it makes sense yeah. well all i can say is if i ever had cancer i'd be doing my the therapy that i that we developed i wouldn't be doing anything else <laughs> that's a, that's how confident i am in, in, in what it is well very good well thomas i, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, i know this is going to be tremendous interest so thank you for taking the time okay all right thank you you've been listening to almost here around the corner future technology podcast with richard jacobs 
Subscribe to this podcast, post a review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.